Uh, great. So, uh, so far uh, we have discussed about some of the important fundamentals of data science. Uh, we talk about how you can get the data from the web or from API and how you can get a different databases and handle that, mm, like different data models, etc. cetera. Uh, one thing which is uh, very important is that these two actually are very related are entity resolution and missing data. So this data that you will get, it, say you have a good database for them. How do you want to uh, make sure that not two entities are the same? Or if you consider two databases, you may want to just make sure that um, like you want to find those entities which are the same. We will talk more about it. And of course, filling the missing data, we already talked about it, but we will go once more essentially to finalize everything. Uh, and then uh, visualization. So this class, we are talking briefly about, uh, I mean, visualizations, the, uh, the way that you can use it using matplotlib. We will mention the basic stuff there, but uh, the actual things will happen in a later session that we will talk about and say that, okay, uh, this is the matplotlib, you have already uh, tried several things there, but what are the basics of visualization? Which diagram we should use it at which uh, case? And that we will deep, do a deep dive there, the same way that we have done it for SQL. And like essentially we talk about the tables and the operations, and then we went and had a deep dive into the actual uh, things. Uh, good. So uh, these are the three things that we are talking, entity resolution, missing data, and visualizations. So uh, entity resolution, say you have a table of products, and you want to find those items which are the same. This is that these are the same entities. There are, uh, this is called entity resolution. One application of entity resolution is to dedupe or deduplication. It means that if there's a duplication, you want to remove it. Or you may want to merge it. Uh, in a bit more general form, this is the another application of entity resolution. You can consider the digital world. Everyone has several avatars, say, for example, in social media. I don't believe anyone has only one Gmail account or it has only one Facebook account. The people generally have a few. And these are, I will call it, avatar of the actual person. So here in the real world, we have two people here. But in the digital world, uh, we have several people. And these people... Some of them can be mapped to, I mean, we are assuming that each person is coming from out of a real person. If there are bots or others, we can consider that one as well. But say for now that everyone is coming from a, like a, the avatar of one person. But one person can have several avatars. So here we are talking about, the, I mean, in the digital world, we are seeing this person, it is called the records or mention. So that's the information that we have. And what is the idea? The idea is that we want to actually find all avatars of a report. A, a problem uh, very similar to that is the record linkage problem. What is this one? Here you have two database A and B, and you want to match uh, um, like a Sometimes you have, for example, the social security or something that you can completely match, but sometimes you don't have it. For example, you have the people at uh, Facebook and the people at Amazon. You want to match these entities together. These have the database of the users at Facebook and Amazon, and you want to match. That's the thing that is, you, it is called, essentially, uh, you try to link records that match across data. The problems are very similar to each other in the sense that, I mean, this problem you can consider you will concat these two database, and then you will, if there are some records that does not exist in the other one, you just put it NAN, 
Then those that are similar, you want to find them and then merge them. And this, some of these NANs will disappear. But that's one way essentially to solve them. Uh, and what is the, uh, I mean, the objective that we have it, one thing is we want to do it is trying to create this kind of reference table that you want to have this kind of uh, noisy records, noisy in a sense that each of them is coming from a different thing and then you may not have the all information, to somehow clean records in the reference table. So this reference table are the actual people, and then you try to say that, okay, this person, these are all avatars of this person, for example, and these are all avatars of this other person. Good. So this one, this problem itself also calls sometimes reference matching, but all of them are the same. The question is that why do we need? So um, I mentioned, uh, let me just see if this one, see if there are any things that I mentioned. Uh, good. So all of them are coming from this one. As I mentioned, the data has a value you may get a diff data from different sources and say lots of them are government data that are available. For example, the housing data. You can search essentially any address and you see who is the owner of this house. These are public information. Or I don't know. Uh, for example, the salaries of the people who are working for government, you can find it. And, but the issue is that some of them, are, and it would be an interesting thing so that who owns this house and then salary of this person. These are in two different databases. You want to find essentially like how much is the salary of a person who has this house. Generally to do that, you need to do a join operation. So in some sense, one of the main applications of entity resolution is for the join operation, such that you can find the same ID here and here, and then you can join on that particular column. But to do so, you need to make sure that these two people are the same. Or as I mentioned, you can put everything in one database and then try to do that. There is a lot of value in this one. So uh, uh, if you can get this data from different sources, especially if these are online data, if this is like aesthetic, this is the problem is that somebody just downloaded it and that then has the, all the information that you have. But if it is online, then you need to do it every day. You need to get the data and process them. That's the thing that makes it harder, but more valuable. So you get this data. And like one particular application that I work with this one, for example, and it has lots of applications, is in the advertisement world, essentially. In the advertisement world, you may, uh, you may get essentially some kind of uh, I think we, we discussed it, that you are, you get some kind of display ad. So this is some ad slot that you want to fill it. And the question is that who is the user that sees this page? Generally, I mean, there are some information that comes from this person, maybe some person from uh, that you can report that this person is from um, Facebook or like from web, uh, from Facebook website or from, uh, Google or any other website, Microsoft. Uh, so this, you can get it from cookies. But the issue is that uh, you want to show something, for example, uh, about this person is from the Facebook. You want to see who is this person. Interestingly, uh, why this is important? Because if you know that this person, is this Facebook person is the same person that uh, essentially the same user that two days ago bought something from Amazon, I can just show some relevant ad to it. So it is uh, very important that you can match these things. And actually there are companies that they are doing this for you. You can go there, that's their main thing. They create this kind of the, um, they, call, they call it essentially universal ID. Uh, a famous company is doing that currently is Trade Desk that you try to get the IDs. You have an ID for Facebook, you have an ID at, 
Google, you have an ID at Amazon, Microsoft, all of them, lots of other companies, they don't, uh, you name it essentially. And Upwork, others. And then you try to match them so that all these users of these different ideas, these are the same person. These are exactly the same. If you have it, then you join that, then you have much more information from that person. Another example, for example, you may think about a person who has a Netflix account who sees some movies, and that person also has a YouTube or Gmail account. She's also used for YouTube. So then you want to see that what are the movies that this person has seen there and what are the things that are have seen there. If you can join these two things, if you know that this person is the same person here, the ideas, everything might be different actually. But you need to somehow figure it out this person is the same person as here. Then you can match them. And then, for example, YouTube can suggest much better movies for that person because you have much more information. Whenever you have much more information, then you can train these systems better using machine learning approaches that we discussed, and you get much more precise results or suggestions. So there is a lot of valuations. So the idea is that if you have this, if you know these people are the same, you will essentially know more information about it. If you know this information, then in advertisement board, you can target it much better. It means that the probability that this person essentially uh, uh, the probability that this person uh, click on that or buy the item that you are advertising would be higher, and that directly uh, uh, essentially implies more profit for you. Or any person who shows that. So it is a super important problem that you can do this integer resolution. And uh, they mentioned there are companies that they just sell this information. You will say this idea of uh, essentially Facebook, for example, that you get it from cookies, and then you will give it, and it gives you all the other IDs that all, and not only the IDs, but also uh, some of the properties of this person. You can buy this information. Then based on that, you are doing some advertisement or other things. Good. And as I mentioned, the, a similar problem is a uh, it's called dedupe or deduplication problem that essentially you try to cluster all records and mention that correspond to the same entity. You try to merge them or delete everyone except one and other. So these are all the same type of entity resolution. As I mentioned, so if you know the cluster, then you will keep only one person for that, one representative of it. So uh, these are some assumptions that we are making here. I mean, correct for lots of databases, but not all the time. It might be some cases that it is not correct for them. So uh, the first thing that each record or mention is associated with a single real world entity. So that's an assumption that we have. It. So these are bots, etc. I mean, that's a different word. Still, you can model them, but maybe sometime a little bit different. So for each record mention or avatar actually has a real person. If two records are mentioned are identical, then there are uh, true matches. What's the meaning of that? If two things, I mean, this is essentially that each person is match of itself, which is a trivial thing. And here, M true essentially means that you can think about this as a classification problem, that you are giving some machine learning algorithm, I said you will give two records every day, they are the same or not. True means yes, false means no. So what is the difference between this problem and entity resolution versus classification? I think entity resolution, uh, uh, mm. Yeah, I would say actually entity resolution may be a uh, better thing comparing it with the, the clustering. So, I mean, in this case, clustering actually makes more sense. 
So uh, what is the difference? Those clustering and entity resolution, these are essentially two important problems of unsupervised learning. In the supervised learning, generally, uh, as we discussed before, you, you are giving x1, x2 to xn, and then you are giving essentially y, say y here. And then you are giving again x prime one, x prime two, x prime n, and then you will get y prime. So in the supervised learning, you are this wise for some of this data you know, but for some others you don't know. And the idea is that how can you fill in the rest of this data? This is generally uh, supervised learning that you have a labeled data. In unsupervised learning, that clustering, I mean, the clustering is actually the, one of probably the main problem, if not equivalent of um, if it is not uh, equivalent of uh, uh, unsupervised learning. So it's a very important problem. You try to, what you do in clustering, in the clustering, you try to uh, see the uh, objects and similar objects, you try to put them in the same cluster. Good. Now, and the first thing is that uh, this uh, entity resolution is indeed a clustering problem, correct? Why? Because you have a different entities and you try to uh, put them essentially those that are similar to each other, you want to put them in the same uh, category. So I want to actually mention this uh, entity resolution versus clustering. Then I will talk about the classification as well. So that also has, but uh, several differences here are the same. In particular, uh, if you have R records, expect that how many matches happens. So generally, each person has a constant number of avatars. So it means that if you have this one, if you have R records, you may have order R matches. Because as I mentioned, each person has a constant number of matches. And this is the concept of order that you already talked about it. And you should, I mean, uh, know more about it because, of, as I mentioned, the reference to my uh, introduction to algorithms uh, class on YouTube. So if you go there, actually, you will see more about the order. So here, the constant number of uh, essentially it can be, I mean, maybe R over two, for example, or R over three matches. These matches, you can put them all in one class. Then, how many non matches you have? The number of, so how many pairs do we have? R choose two. What? So R choose two pairs you have, which is essential. This is equal to R times R minus one over two, which is order R square. So one uh, difference that you have it between this problem and clustering is that uh, this is the difference between both clustering and classification. In this kind of entity resolution, uh, you have order R clusters because each matching would be corresponding to cluster. While in typical clustering algorithm, the number of clusters is constant or sublinear. Sublinear means essentially a square root of R, but not R. So that's one difference essentially between uh, this problem and clustering. The number of a typical, I mean, of course, in a clustering, you can have lots of clusters as well, but typically the number of clusters are limited or constant or sublinear. Here, the number of clusters are too many. So uh, 
And also, uh, as I mentioned, in the clustering, generally, some cluster can be very large because there's only constant number of them. But in ER, generally, the clusters, the number of them is linear in R. And the average cluster size is also constant. It is not big because each person can create only a few avatars. In particular, uh, lots of uh, a good number of clusters are just single. Right. Some people may have just only essentially one avatar, one account, one Gmail account or one Facebook account. But that's a clustering thing. Now, what about, uh, uh, that's the thing I wanted to first talk about clustering, that why this entity resolution is a clustering. And this clustering and uh, entity resolutions are two important problems in unsupervised learning. So I mentioned essentially about supervised learning that you have this label data. What about unsupervised learning? Unsupervised learning, you don't have such kind of data. You don't know which, where this should be in which clusters. So you don't have this kind of label data and you need to figure it out the best cluster or the best entity resolutions. So in some sense, there is no clear label data that we are considering. It. So clustering and entity resolution, these are two important problems in uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, there are the, I mean, clustering, it seems a more general problem or entity resolution is a special type of clustering and it has more properties. We will talk about it. But in the typical clustering, you don't have it. Uh, last uh, but not least, essentially, <laughs> what about the classification? So uh, uh, this problem, as I mentioned, uh, the one that you are giving, to, you can consider this one as a machine learning. So what is a classification? Classification is a typical machine learning approach versus regression that we talk about. In a classification, you can say that I'm giving two records and the model should say whether these two are the same or not. These two records. So you can train the system for doing that. So essentially, you are gi I'm giving these two records, and then I'm tra I have trained essentially this one who says whether they are the same or not. Let's say you have, uh, if you have enough data, then you can train this. But there are some uh, issues here. So if you consider this problem as a clustering problem, so clustering means that you are giving this, you say true means match, false means not match. The amount of truths essentially is order R, and the number of falses would be, or not true, would be R square. This generally creates an imbalance uh, so this creates some imbalance. What's the meaning of imbalance? Generally, this kind of uh, ML approaches work better, not all of them, but lots of them, if there are some balance between true and false. Here, you don't have this true and false because uh, I mean, like you don't have this balance because one is order R, the other one is R square. And uh, of course, I mean, here, when we consider this problem as a classification problem, instances are pairs of record. You will give essentially two records to the system and then says yes or no. So uh, what is the summary? So the summary is that this entity resolution that has lots of applications, can we consider a special case of clustering? Can we consider a special case of classifications? Approaches. But in a sense, it is different from, or it has some properties that make the study of entity resolution unique. And because of that, there are lots of researches, current researches that are done to do entity resolution in a better way, such that you can, I mean, and again, the, the problem because it is a unsupervised learning, there is no like completely true or completely false answer. Clustering, I mean, you want to cluster this, whether this cluster is better than that, there are some measures, but you don't say this clustering is wrong, this clustering is true. Each of them can be correct to some extent. So you want to get this entity resolution uh, to the, uh, you want to get some things to, uh, to the best extent, essentially, you try to get the solutions for this entity resolution. 
And we will talk about this clustering and classifications and the differences more here in this session. So this is the thing that we talk about it. Uh, good. So we talk about uh, the applications of entity resolution and two important problems, clustering, uh, that is entity resolution is a special uh, two important supervised learning as well as classifications. Classification is a typical machine learning that you try to do these things. Yes. So one other just uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention here. Uh, this is, for example, one difference between classifications and uh, this. Uh, entity resolution is that uh, you have this one that if this item and this item, this is the transitivity. Transit. Transit. The transitivity. But the transitivity is so that, like, for example, this person here, A and B, are matched. Essentially, is belonging to M2. And then you have B and C also belong to M of true. Then you know that in the entity resolution, then A and C also should be M of true. They should be matched. This transitivity is something that if you just try to, if you have the data, you have some data that you want to train the model. This transitivity is not necessarily correct in the classification. Because there is no guarantee that if the model for these two guys, it may give true, these other two guys may give true, but these two guys, it may give false. But this is somehow a must, or we will talk, it's a hard constraint for entity resolution. You really want to make sure that this transitivity happens. And that's the point that, for example, makes it different from just classification. So it is somehow classification is more constraints that makes it possibly a different problem. The same thing also you can say for the clustering. For the clustering also, there are some of these properties that we will discuss that not necessarily any clustering has these properties. So these are a special kind of clustering or a special kind of uh, classifications. Good. So now you want to do entity resolution, you need to do a few steps. The first thing is that you need to prepare the data always. So you have this data that you got it from um, somewhere. You may scrape the web or you may have some, use some API to get this data. Then you put it on some database. The first thing that you need to do that is that you need to find these entities that you try to find resolution for them. Good. So you need to essentially uh, this find this entity. You need to recognize. Them. So it might be it come from text. Sometimes it come might be records uh, in the database. But you need to see exactly what is that. Maybe there's some big text that you need to get actually some uh, entities out of it. And these are the typical things that you can do it. You need to maybe to do this kind of uh, do information extraction. You need to do a text or semi-structured um, data approaches uh, or uh, other type of things to get this data out of the source that you have. Generally, I mean, lots of them, you can consider this one as a parsing. So parsing essentially means that this data that you will get, it might be text or other things. It might be even in your database, but it still is not the form that you want to do entity resolution. So you essentially need to see what are the potential entities that you try to match. So one thing that will be very useful here, it might be feature engineering. So feature engineering, uh, what do, what do we do? We identify attributes that might be useful for matching. We will talk about this. In general, uh, before all this era of deep neural nets, 
feature engineering played a very important role. It still is playing important role as well. What is the feature engineering? You have a data. You want to see that what are the important features of this data that I can use, for example, to learn this data. I mean, the classic setting, you decide about the feature in this neural networks, uh, or neural nets, essentially. This, um, Nodes, I mean, you are creating essentially some neural nets which has lots of nodes, etc. And these uh, features are the ones that will be determined in the neural net essentially. You don't manually select them. They, these features will be somehow recognized by the whole learning algorithm. What is the good thing? What is the bad thing about the good thing is that, okay, you don't need to go and individually find what are the features. But the bad thing is that they are not interpretable. So this node has these properties and then based on that, you can say this one is a cat or a dog. But you don't know what is the exact, why this node can recognize it. It is not interpretable. And this is the, one of the problems with uh, neural nets which are not interpretable, at least in the classics. So, but this, but this feature engineering actually something will be helpful to do a better entity resolution. Sometimes we will talk about it. Another thing that will be very useful is schema normalizations that we need to do. That a schema means essentially the type, the type of the data that you have. It might be different that you need to normalize it. And in addition of the, this type, you may do also data normalizations on top of that as well. Uh, let's, I mean, talk, uh, so this part, this kind of parsing, we already talked about the approaches that you can use it, beautiful soap and other things that they give you lots of approaches such that you can do it, or the grammars or uh, this kind of regular expression that you can use such that you can extract the item, the, this kind of um, entities. We will talk about feature engineering, but let me talk more a little bit about schema normalization and data normalization. So what's the meaning of uh, schema normalization? For example, you want to first have a schema matching, means the type of the matching. So in some database, it may say, I mean, you have a database, you created this one. One says contact number, the other one is say phone number. In this case, you should say that, oh, these two are the same. In other cases, these are com compound attributes. So in one, you have the full address, for a person. In the other one, you have it a street, city, a state, zip code, etc. So to do this kind of entity resolution, you need to make this one, normalize it into the one format, either this or that. That depends to your application. There are other things, this is like nested attributes. So it might be the case that, for example, in the one data set, it says that, uh, uh, like, what are the properties of an apartment? And just list air conditioning, parking, etc. In another database, you may have each feature, for example, you have a column for air conditioner. And you have another column for parking. And each of them, it has, I mean, essentially true or false. So these are like a different representation of the same data, but you need to normalize them into one versus other. Like you cannot, uh, essentially these are like somehow at this stage is apple and oranges. You cannot compare them. To make a comparison, you need to make either both of them apple or orange. It depends which one is more. Uh, some of them uh, essentially, this is also somehow similar to the previous one, set value attributes. So in one, essentially, you may have but just one field that talks about a set of phones or phone numbers. In the other one, you have primary phone and secondary. And you need to, again, make them the same. So uh, these are some of the things that you may do. You may do, there are some other things like record segmentations and others that you can read more about them. But essentially, the idea is that, uh, in some sense, you may have some of these 
records generally I mean all of them essentially you may have some big text for example here the address the full address has one text versus the other one it has the separate entities for city street state others and you need to make them normalize into one form. So then, so this is a schema normalization or type normalization. There is another one. It is the data that you try to normalize. Here, you convert all data to upper or lower bound, or lower, essentially, uh, 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 alphabets. So uh, you may have uh, all lower characters or all upper characters. And you may want to remove white space. That is the way that you will make sure that, I mean, because if one, I don't know, is uh, this street might be different from the other one, but the issue that this one, the, the first letter is capital versus the other one, which is non-capital. You want to make them essentially this. <laughs> so the other thing is that, I mean, you might want to detect and <clears throat> correct values that contain non-typographical errors or variations. So you may essentially see these different things. Some of them may have some errors and you try to fix them. This is like the data correction in some sense. Sometimes you want to consider uh, abbreviations and replace them with the standard words. The nickname mm -hmm. you want to essentially uh, you want to give the actual names, because then you can do it more apple to apple or orange to orange operations. Again, you, these are the information that you try to do it in the same format, such that you can do possibly the join operations. Uh, some of these operations actually can be done based on dictionaries. So these dictionaries are commercial dictionaries or, uh, or postal addresses, etc. A good example is this one. If you go to your bank, <clears throat> and then you say that I want to do change address, you will do change the address. Then you do that. After that, you will enter some address, and then it brings some other thing. He said, do you mean this address? This is the address which is essentially corresponding to your address that they have it on some kind of commercial dictionaries or commercial postal code. That's the closest one. Why? Because they want to make sure that when you say some uh, data, it is the actual data that you have lots of information about it. So there you will go and according to the postal address dictionaries, find the closest to you and say, oh yeah, this is the, my address. So they know that your address is a specific address and in a specific format. Another thing is that, uh, okay, so this one uh, is the one that I want to come back to. This is the feature engineering. So, uh, consider this example, actually. This is a good one. So say you have R essentially, uh, you have uh, 1,000 cities. And each of these cities has R, which is equal to 1,000 different businesses. The businesses, they may have a different name essentially. What is the idea? You want to do entity resolution in this. So 1,000 city, each of them have 1,000 businesses as entities, and you want to match them and find those that are the same business. Because you got this one, this data from some text from web or something like that. If you want to do it naively, how many uh, companies you have? You have 1,000 1, city, each of them have 1,000 uh, companies. So it would be 1 million companies to How many pairs that we need to consider it to see whether they are matched or not would be 1 million to the two. This is R squared that's in that video. It means that you need to do 1 trillion comparisons. 
it takes 11.6 days if each comparison it takes only one microsecond. Huge. <laughs> However, here this is the one that feature engineering plays an important role. that mentions or records from different cities are unlikely to be matched. Good. So it means that you just consider each city and then do it separately. Try to find solve this entity resolution separately. It is called the blocking criteria here is the city. Essentially, it's the one that we are doing this feature engineering and this city would be a feature that we decide that it's a very good feature to distinguish essentially true from false. Let's see how many comparisons we have. So here we have 1,000 cities. In each city, we have 1,000 companies. How many comparisons do I, do, I should do it? I should, for each city, I should do it separately. Different cities, I should do it separately. So 1,000 comparisons. Then the 1,000 uh, like items to companies to compare would be 1,000 to the two, which is 1 million. And then I have 1,000 city, it would be 1,000 times this, which is actually 1 billion. Now, again, if each comparison takes only one uh, microsecond, then it only takes 16 minutes to compare all of these pairs and see whether they are the same and you can do the list. Now, this idea of blocking, what are the items that, I mean, of course, this may result in some uh, wrong things sometimes because maybe they are even the different cities are the same. Just mention it or misspelled or something we can say. So it is not completely uh, uh, like you. Uh, It's not a, a complete measure that always works, but lots of cases actually it may work, depending on your data. And here, this finding this blocking criteria, and these are like part of the feature engineering that you do that, you will find important features of your data that you can use them to do uh, this work of, for example, machine learning, or in this case, uh, entity resolution in a better sense. As I mentioned, so uh, here we are generally you are using easy to evaluate criterion as a blocking criterion. And uh, this may cause some uh, false negative, depending on how noisy are your data. And it is uh, domain specific. So you need to see which, what type of thing you try to do that for some data it may work, some other it may not work. I mean, there are some other techniques here. This is, as I mentioned, the active area of research. You can read about uh, mean hash signatures. It's, up, it's the approach that can be used for these things. Good. So, so far what we have done it, we essentially, uh, we got our data because it's from scraping or some API. And then we have killing the data we have done essentially this kind of uh, uh, we have done uh, uh, a schema uh, preparation, a schema normalization and data normalization. So we have done this. And then maybe you say that what are the potential matches? Like in each city you should consider it. Different cities you should consider them. Then you are doing to this a step of data matching. So what is this uh, data matching? What is data matching is essentially you are trying to produce a comparison vector. So you try to form a comparison vector and based on this vector, you decide whether these are the matches or not. This example. So you are getting essentially two citations for two articles. 
x and y, and you want to compute a similarity a score of component attributes. So from this uh, citation, you try to create some tables. How can you create it? So this is the, uh, you can try to create essentially a vector. So this is the vector that you are doing. Say for example, the first author match score. Two articles you are considering it. Whether, uh, I mean, uh, so this is essentially the one that you are trying to form. So the first item is the first uh, author match score. The second was that paper match score, like in terms of the title. Then you match a score, year match score and so on and so forth. From these two records, so this is the record A essentially, and this is record B. Here the record A and B, both of them are some citations. You are creating this table essentially. <laughs> this is some essentially similarity score that you create. Similarity score that you are doing it, I mean, it can be different things. For example, it can be <laughs> Boolean. Whether, for example, author matches or not, uh, true or false. Or it can be, uh, <clears throat> real values based on some distance function. You want to say, what is the distance between the, uh, the first name, uh, the first uh, author, name here and the first author name here. We will talk about this. This can be, so based on the distances functions, it can be based on the set or vector similarities. So for each of these entities, so that's the thing that we are forming a comparison vector. We form a vector, each, I mean that it has some essentially columns, each of them is just talking about different, uh, somehow, similarity measures. Now, one easy way, essentially, is to do that. Form this one, then you may have a different way. For example, if the paper title match, this might be 100% essentially weight. I don't know, uh, first author match, that might be 50% value. You will consider this weighted a score, then you will put some threshold tau. If this weighted score is greater than tau, then you say that this is a match. Otherwise, you will say it's not a match. Good. So that's one simple way to essentially do this data matching. Consider any two records, some important vector, comparison vector based on some important uh, features. Maybe get essentially the weighted score if greater than some threshold say to match, otherwise you will say not match. Uh, of course, this is just the beginning of this. There is a book, uh, Data Matching by P. Christian, that in 2012 is just talking about this data matching, how you can do it. We cannot cover everything in the class, this is just some beginning. In general, uh, so uh, this is the thing. So uh, you try to form essentially between any two things, some uh, uh, like comparison uh, vector. However, the algorithm that you are doing, it might be more complicated than that. So one question is that these weights that you are finding it here, these weights, this is W1, W2 to W, I don't know, K, if K attributes you have it, this weights actually may come from some, uh, for example, uh, linear regression model. So you may write, uh, so you may use some uh, ML model that based on this data, it finds what are the importance of each of these fields. And then uh, based on that, you will give essentially true or false. It's even more general. Talked about this thing that this vector that you are forming. This is essentially is very similar to this kind of uh, uh, feature engineering. In some sense, we are feature engineering here. What are the important uh, attributes of this comparison vector? You may consider a neural net instead of that. You may not know what are the important things. You may give the whole things in the 
neural net that decides what are the important factors, what are the important attributes, and what should be the weight of each of them. The only thing that you need to have in your mind if you want to do that is that for neural nets, generally, you need much more data comparing to the data that you are doing the feature engineering. So if you have lots of data, you can do it, and lots of label data, because you need to say what are the match, what are the non match if you consider that as a classification. Then uh, you need to have lots of this data such that this uh, neural nets actually perform well. Otherwise, it would be better to just compute such kind of uh, comparison vector, and then the weights, you can use it some other machine learning approaches. That might be a smaller data that works much better. So uh, uh, here, I want to talk a little bit about this similarity score. So each of these scores, it might be different. So for example, here, uh, this, uh, so, what are these records A and B? So I don't know. May it has first name, essentially say first name. Then it has the last name. Then I don't know. It has maybe social security, not in this case, not social security number. Maybe it has the paper title. <laughs> the year, etc. that has been published this is. And based on that, you are forming this comparison. So each of these fields, you need to give, I mean, compare with them and give some similarity scores. So for each of them, you may need to do some kinds of things, uh, in some sense, recursively. So you need to say that if these two are text or strings, of course, you can consider everything as a string. But if, for example, these are the phone numbers of a person, it would be better to don't consider it as a string. You need to consider it as a set. Sometimes, actually, in a, a, another thing that you can uh, do it. And, and by the way, sets are also vectors themselves. Why? Because if you have the set, for example, that has one, three, five in it, and the, so generally you can form essentially a vector of the whole universe. If all these numbers are between one to ten thousand, say for example for zip code, then you have it one, two, three to ten thousand. So then it is one. So you will put it one equal to. Uh, one then three here you will put it one and then five you will put it one and all others would be zero so a set actually can be represented by a vector as well you might a, a text also can be embedded into a vector we will talk more about it when we talk about this kind of a a word to vector stuff. That's the important thing that we will talk about. It that the ideas come again from neural nets. So these are all combinations we are doing essentially. So inside this, we may use some machine learning models inside entity resolution, such that we can get better data. Such that on top of that, we can do a better machine learning things. But but anyhow, so these are typical things that we need to. Consider so each of these when you talk about match or non-match, especially when if of course it boolean means complete match or not complete match. If you have done the normalization, for example, all non-capital, maybe that work essentially, and remove spaces etc. But uh, generally, boolean is not the best thing. Is the best one is actually do some real values based on distance functions or set or vector similarities that we will talk more. So each of these entities to fill in, you may need to use some of the similarity scores that we will define. So, so essentially, we want to find some similarity between two fields. How can we do that? Then it is different. What is the type of what is the edit distance? Edit distance is a useful one if you want to do text. So what is the edit distance? For example, here, generally, this is the 
it's the most famous one is the uh, Levinish chain uh, distance. It's the minimum number of changes to go from one reference, one reference here, one string to another one. What are these changes? It can be a single character insertion or deletion or substitution. Let's see an example. For example, here you have A, B, C, and you have A, D. You want to see what is the difference between these? What is the distance between them? So here, to get from here to here, you need to delete C, one operations, and then you may want to delete, and you want to replace B with D. So one substitution and one deletion. So the distance between these two would be two. Of course, this is the basic uh, operations, basic things that edit distance. Uh, and by the way, if you want to find the edit distance between two strings, there's a uh, famous dynamic, uh, dynamic programming algorithm that you can do it. So if there, there are two strings of both lengths and the edit distance, It takes order and score. If you want to get exact, there are other variations. Like you may give a different weight to substitutions versus insertion and deletion. It might be the case that, for example, substituting B with D is different from substituting B with I don't know E. Different substitution might be different cost. So there are lots of these variations. And this is the active area of research. This is actually one area that we are working on. And uh, for example, the weighted version of that is the one that we had recently. I mean, we had some improvement on the best running times. This n square, uh, or like uh, sometimes you don't want to get maybe the exact, you want to get approximate at the distance. Because this n square, it can be large. So in general, consider, for example, two genomes or two DNAs. They can be very large one, and you find to find the edit distance. It might be very essentially inefficient if you want to n square, but you want to get approximate one. This is actually some area that we have it like a state of the art thing, how you can compute the string uh, edit distance of two string uh, using a spark in a, in a parallel model, essentially. Or like this massively parallel computation. So yes, so uh, it, there are active areas of research or like the thing that you may want to find it, but not exactly want to get approximate one. This is actually the result that uh, we initiated that one that you can get, for example, instead of n square, you can get something better than that. You can actually get order n, you can get constant. Factor approximation. So we we were actually we initially improved from this n square to something uh, sub quadratic. I think uh, no no n to the something like one point six. You could get constant factor three approximation for the problem, but this has been later improved by others like to order n constant factor approximation. This is still this would be much more tolerable. Why? Because uh, if you have two strings, if you want to, these are larger strings, you want to do n square, it can be very inefficient to do that. There are other ways to do that, like for example, a set similarity. So, uh, what is the set? So, when you have two sets, you want to see what is, how much these two are similar to each other. This is like the set of the phone numbers. You want to see the contact. So, you might consider the intersection size of them or the union of them. But the best one to do that is the jacquard distance. What is the jacquard distance? This is the size of intersection over the size of union. For example, if you have two sets, both of them, they have A, then the size of intersection would be one, the size of the union would be one. So one over one would be one. So it means that these are essentially the distance between one. But say if this guy, has a b so in this case the size of the intersection would be one but the size of the union would be a b so it would be two so the distance between them essentially is or similarity actually between them decreases from one to one half but that's the jacquard distance that you will hear a lot whenever you have the sets you want to compare them this jacquard distance is the best another thing is the vector similarity this vector similarity is another one that is used a lot uh, one application of these vector similarities. Uh, as I mentioned, all this text, essentially this uh, 
work that was worth to make. So word to make is a general idea that how you can embed any word to some vectors. It's not the original thing that came from Google, but it has been used for lots of other things. Nowadays, everything to VEC, like for example, product to VEC, graph to VEC, note to VEC, lots of other ones. But it's the general idea is that you embed anything into some uh, uh, essentially vectors of dimension 1000 to four, uh, like 100 to 400. That's a typical thing. Anything that you have, there's a way you will just embed it into these vectors. Now, when you embed into the vector, now you want to find the similarity between two vectors. One of the good measures is the cosine similarities. What is the cosine similarity? Essentially, you will find, you will embed this. Uh, th so this is the space here. It can be three-dimensional set of. This is the, uh, this is the uh, I don't know, anything that you have it, you will map it to here. This is another one. That you will map it to B. And then you will find essentially the cosine similarity that these two vectors you will consider it, and then you will consider the cosine of between these uh, two vectors. Uh, that is based on that. So you can read about the cosine similarity. So if your data is a text, you want to find similarity, you may use edit distance, or you may want to use, uh, if these are the sets, you may want to use sim set similarities, or you want to use vector similarities. As I mentioned, for example, if you want, if you have sets, you can represent these sets as a vector, but the issue is that if you represent it, the dimensions of that would be high. So you may need to add, uh, embed this vector, we will talk more about it in the future sessions, how you can embed it about the word to make. Then you will embed it into some uh, uh, vectors of dimension 100 to 400. The original vector may have size the zip code. It may have 10,000 items. But you embed it between to something 100 to 400 to 400. It's called dimensionality reduction. You will do that. Then the size of this vector will be much smaller. But then you will use essentially vector similarities to find it. But there are several ways. Even for two sets, you can use jacquard distance, or you can turn them into some vectors, and you get essentially the distance according to the vector. For different applications, some, some of this may work better. Question. Yeah. So two dimensions, you take the cosine relative to like the x axis, right? No, no, no. Uh, this is for arbitrary number of dimensions. Because these are two vectors in the higher dimensions, you can find the uh, cosine of these two vectors. All of them would be essentially from the origin to that, to this even high dimension, and you have a vector. And between any two vectors, you can compute the cosine of this. So you take cosine of every, every dimension? And no, no. Cosines of the angle between these two vectors. Just got it, got it, got yeah. it. So you do the angle between the vectors exactly. regardless of that. Exactly. Okay. And this is the one I mean, you, you can get the exact cosine similarity. That's, that's the most famous one, essentially. There are other ways for vector similarities. You may get essentially the difference between these two vectors. But that's not the best one. The best one is the cosine similarity that works the best. So if you have set, naturally, you want to use Jacquard distance. If you have vector similarity, you may want to use cosine similarity. If you have edit distance, you may want to use essentially this. Uh, if you have a strings, you may want to use edit distance. And you may. It is not cheap for the compute, but you may need to use these approximate versions, which are actually faster. You can get it order n, especially if the text is large, then you may want to use it. And depending on that, you will compute it. And then this uh, uh, vector that I have mentioned, using this, these are like some, some kind of subroutines that you will use it such that you can fill in this uh, uh, comparison vector. And then based on that, you will put weights and you will decide whether these are the same. Uh, what was your question? You have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you be higher? Um, the cosine of the two vectors, yes. Yes. Yes, I mean, the, uh, the cosine essentially, you see that if you consider the cosine of two vectors, if these are like, like essentially on each other, then the, the things would be zero. The angle between them would be zero, and the cosine of that would be one. It means that these are very similar. But if these are perpendicular to each other, then the, it would be essentially zero. The, this, the angle would be 90 degrees. The cosine would be essentially zero. It means that these are not similar. Similar except for magnitude. 
Yes, I mean, you go the exact uh, uh, things that magnitude sometimes play a bit less roles. Sometimes, I mean, the, actually the magnitude is not the one because one is just scaled of the others. So but you can just see the exact cosine similarity. I think we will actually we will mention the exact one. Yes, but you just search it. Uh, uh, Google or chat GPT will get the exact formula. I mean, all of them are somehow, it, which one is correct, which one is wrong? There is no answer like that. Some, for this, for example, Jacquard distance generally works well for the sense. But some instance, it may not work. The same thing here. Cosine similarity, yes, you may want to say that actually, uh, how large are these things? That is important. That may work. And uh, then, there are something that there are some slight changes that more or one data better than others. Uh, there is another thing which is very important, which is the uh, Q grams. This Q grams that are actually are, this is also very useful one. What is this one? Here you are finding all lengths Q substring in each string. So, for example, you have A, B, C, D, E, and the other one is have A, D. Good. What is the two grams? The two grams, for example, AB would be one, BC would be one, CD would be one, and D would be one versus AD. Good. So from this string, you actually create a set. So the set is AB, BC, CD, and D. And this other one is AD. So this is the one that you are getting from the substrings. So Q grams means essentially any two that are like the length Q substrings. But uh, you may actually uh, consider as a sequence. You may so this is one way to generate this one. Uh, the other way is that you may want to consider all pairs. So for example, here you have A B, A C, A D, A E, and then you have B C. B, D, B. So in one, we consider only consecutive ones. The other one, you are considering anything. Different application might be different. But what is the idea? The idea is that now I can turn these strings into a set. And again, as I mentioned, set is also a vector. So sometime, actually, if you make the strings, consider them as a uh, Q grams, Q essentially can be any number. One gram would be essentially A, B, C, D, E, each of them versus D. So if you consider one gram here, it would be A, it would be the set which has A, B, C, D, E. This is the first one, and the second one is A, D. Good. So then you can compare this set. So for example, I mean, this actually, if you, no, from these two string, you want to see what is the distance between them, you could just use the edit distance, but that might be a bit more time consuming. Here, you want to just use this one. Then you will say A, B, C, D, E versus A, D. So then you will use the set jacquard distance. The jacquard distance, if you cut it, then the distance between this would be the intersection has only A, size A, the union has size 5. So the, the similarity between them would be 1 over 5. So instead of computing using edit distance, I just computed using jacquard distance. Q grams is used a lot, essentially, in practice, can simply put it. And of course, I mean, uh, these are uh, some of the things that I have mentioned. You can combine any of them, as I mentioned. You can set, you can consider the vector. Vector, you may consider it. I mean, vector also can you consider it as a string. Why? Because what is a vector? The vector is essentially 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. So this is essentially a string. So do you may use any combination of kilograms edit distance, it depends on your applications. But generally, as I mentioned, if you have the strings, you may want to use kilograms or edit distance. If you have sets, you may want to use jacquard distance. If you want, if you have vectors, then you have you may want to use uh, this uh, cosine similarity. These are the ones that works the best in practice as I have experienced myself. So uh, there are some other things also that so you may, these are more specific one. For example, Fundex, a phonetic similarity metric. For, so for example, if you are working with the first name, then you want to say Robert versus Rupert. This, they get the same code. So these are some dictionaries. 
that says essentially these are the same thing, these are the different spelling of the same thing. So this is something that if you want to use edit distance, probably is not the best thing. But if you use some of these dictionaries for first name, these are specific things that you may use it and then get a result. So here, for example, for Robert and Rupert, you get the same code R163. So in that case, if first on the first name, maybe you will apply this uh, uh, Sundex to get the code, and then you will say whether these two things are similar or not. And then, for example, a Rubin, which gets a different R150. As if somehow it's close, but not completely close. You may use some translation tables to handle abbreviations, nicknames, or other things. So this, as I mentioned, to get the set, to get the string, etc., you may use some of these tables essentially to do this. And different types of data may require more domain specific functions. So if you have a, ge a geographical locations or postal addresses, uh, you may actually do different approaches to do so. Uh, because there are some dictionaries for them. A another one which is very important, you may consider two XML or JSON and try to compare them together. To the whole JSON, two websites you want to compare them. There is the actual one to use it is the three edit distance. Again, this is a so you have edit distance and you have three edit distance. Three edit distance is very especially useful for this kind of XML or JSON. Actually, this is again some research that we are doing to finding the best algorithm. If these JSONs are too large, how can you do it in a distributed manner, etc.? This is an active area of research. But that is a useful one if you want to, if you have XML and you want to, you, so because one thing it can be like, this is a record. In one item of this record or one column, it might be some long HTML that you will put it. How do you want to do it that? In that case, it might be better, don't use, for example, the string one. Use instead three edit distance. Because three edit distance is the one that obtains the best essentially, works the best for this type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, XML or JSON. Uh, yeah, I mean, some other things that you will use it, you may use it for different applications. Uh, for example, I mean, one other similarity, if you have some kind of data, I mean, some numbers, you may actually consider the average or max of them. That's another way, essentially, or mean of them. So you have essentially a set of numbers, I mean, some field for this similarity, it might uh, come essentially with some uh, numbers, a set of numbers. So you may want to use Jacquard, essentially, uh, things, or you may want to use average. For example, if you have a different phone number, you may want to use the average phone number as a measure of somehow similarity of these two things or the max of them. There are other things that you can use it depending on your data. So this is the active area of research that I mean, which one you should do it and which one is the best. Good. So, so far, these are the things that we have uh, talked about it, that uh, you can essentially uh, do these things and you want to, uh, find the similarities. Now that you have the similarities, and I think this is the one that the data matching, so they try to create this one. Then, as I mentioned, so when you have these uh, similarities, essentially the similar, uh, the, this compar uh, comparison vector, you may use different ways. You may use some kind of machine learning approaches to see whether these two are the same. You may use some kind of simple thresholding algorithm. Some rule-based algorithms. These rule-based actually are used also a lot in practice. What are these? These are some rules. For example, you want to say that whether these two records are matched or not matched. One idea is that you want to say that, for example, you will say that similar if the similarity between the given given names of these two authors are greater than 0 0.9, and the surnames are exactly the same, and the, essentially the month of publication and the year are the same, then you will say that these two are matched. So these are this rule-based thing that you have a different rules 
that I mean you may use it essentially. These are some kinds of I mean I don't know regular expression or others that you can use it to get essentially the results that you want. So that's rule based is something you can use some machine learning approaches. You may use uh, essentially this kind of rule based algorithm to decide things. So this is the one that I mentioned. So this, you may want to use some kind of classification, classification based approaches, <laughs> but always you need to be careful about these imbalanced classes because lots of them are non-match. And generally this classification, not all of them, but lots of them, they want that you have a some kind of balanced data. Balance means the number of trues and the number of false will be the same. The way to do that, you may want to do essentially some kind of subsampling essentially to make them from, you don't take all the not matched, you don't take all the non-matched, you have just some sample of non-matched. Like order or sample of non-matched versus the matches and then you can get this. Uh, Sometimes, as I mentioned, you may want to, these are like, again, these are, you can use rule-based, you can use essentially this classification approach. And if you want to use, for example, give the weights, one thing that might be useful is that you may want to give weight to matches that involve rare words. For example, if there are two records, two persons, in their comments, both of, use, both of them use some name like this. This is a very rare word. If two people are like some Facebook person and some Amazon person is using this in some comments, you can say, oh, probably these two people are the same. So you can give a higher weight to this type of thing. Uh, one important thing about to make the decisions is that, uh, as I mentioned, either if you want to consider entity resolution as a clustering problem, or if you want to use it as a classification problem, there are some differences that you need to consider. These are the, some of these constraints, these are actually active research the, the people are doing that. Uh, what are these constraints? What is the transitivity? It's so that that we discussed. If M1 and M2 match and M2 and M3 match, then M1 and M3 should match as well. That you not necessarily, you, this, you don't necessarily have it in any in typical clustering algorithm or typical classification. Another one is exclusivity. So that if M1 matches with M2, so for example, this actually the first one is very important one in the uh, deduplication or the typical entity resolution. That if M1 and M2 are the same and M2 and M3 the same, M1 and M3 should be the same. The other one is that linkage problem. In the linkage problem, you have two database and you know that if M1 matches to M2 here, then M3 here should not match to M1. Why? Because the, the, um, because the default that you have it is that all records here in your database, this would be distinct. So in your database, you already resolve the entity. You have done essentially entity resolution. So M1 and M3 would be different. So if M1 is matched to M2 in the, like for example, in this record linkage problem, then it means that M3 should not be matched with M2 because you know that M1 and M3 are not equal. Another thing which is sometimes useful is the functional dependency. This is a bit more general. It says that if M1 and M2 match, then M3 and M4 must match as well. So it's a, this is essentially it's a, because, I don't know, if these two people uh, have, for example, if the these two persons are uh, the same child, then their parents should match as it is more general. So these are uh, these are this kind of functional dependency. For example, the people are considering it here. These are the uh, papers that the people are doing that and see what are the difference with, between this problem and typical classification problem or clustering problem. Another thing that you may have it, you may have positive or negative evidence. For example, what is the positive or negative? So these are some examples of positive. So the transitivity it can be essentially positive things. If M1 and M2 match and M2 and M3 match, then M1 and M3 should match. So this is a positive thing. They should match. Sometimes say you will say, no, they should not match. 
So if M1 and M2 match, M2 and M3 do not match, then M1 and M3 should not match. Why this is important, as I mentioned, this is a classification problem that only order R of them are true, the matching, order R square are non-true. So it is different. Sometimes something implies that some matching should happen. Sometimes something implies that some matching should not happen. And this is the thing that are, this is the positive or negative thing. For example, you say that if M1 doesn't match M2, then M3 can match with M2. This is the positive thing. But the negative, the, uh, the other one exclusivity, the one that we talk is, if M1 matches with M2, then M3 cannot match with M2. The one that we have mentioned. Another thing that here it is important, the hard constraints versus soft constraints. So uh, here, sometimes you have a hard, hard constraint is something that cannot be violated. For example, if M1 and M2 match, then M3 and M4 must match. For example, if there are two citations, if two papers match, their venues should match. That is, there is no, this is a hard constraint. They should definitely match. However, it can be a soft constraint. What is that? that if M1 and M2 match, then M3 and M4 more likely to match. Here it is a soft constraint. It does not say that necessarily they should be matched, but it says that the, the condition, the probability would be higher. For example, if two venues match for two citations, they have the same journal, then their paper are more likely match. If these two things, we will say that their um, corresponding uh, venues, the, the journal are the same, then we know that uh, the paper, not necessarily they match because it might be two different papers in one journal but the chance will be higher. You can say the same thing for the negative evidences as well. So we have this kind of hard con constraint, uh, this one. You may have uh, some of these things, um, this constraint, some of them can be recursive. For example, if two authors have uh, matching co-authors, then they should match. But then how do you know that these two authors have a matching co-author? This is a recursive problem itself. So another condition that we have it is the aggregate constraint. For example, this is a Kant constraint. What's the meaning of that? It means that entity A can link to at most N Bs. For example, authors can have at most five papers in a conference. So if you, you try to do entity resolution and you will see that the same, almost the same name has six papers in this conference, it means that probably one of them is not the previous author. It should be different because each person can have at most five. So this six probably is a different one. You may use instead of the count, I mean, the, you can call it aggregate constraint like sum, average, or other functions essentially. And each of them can be hard or soft constraints and can be positive or negative. So uh, what are these? So this is essentially the things that we are talking about. So we say that this problem is somehow similar, has similarity to classification problems or in general to a clustering problem, but there are other constraints. These constraints can be transitivity and exclusivity or functional dependency that generally does not exist in typical machine learning algorithm. It can be positive or negative. We say that this if this happens, this should be not a match, or if this happens, this should be a match. It can be hard constraints or soft constraints. It means that this should, if these two papers matches, their venues should match. But vice versa is a soft constraint. Says, oh, if these two venues match, then their papers are more likely to match. It does not say that they definitely they should match. So this one, and it can be recursive, or you might be considered some other kinds of like hunt constraints or some constraints, etc. So uh, all it says that this is the entity resolution is a more complex problem than just simple clustering or classifications. And there are active researchers essentially are going based on that. Uh, 
So there are lots of research essentially on this one. And then for different uh, uh, domains, the people have done different things essentially. The same thing as I mentioned. So generally, the unsupervised learning is much more complex problem than supervised learning. Because supervised learning, you can generally use some of these approaches that I have mentioned, like for learning algorithms, XGBoost or uh, LightGBM or some others to do it. But uh, this uh, unsupervised learning, in particular clustering or entity resolution, there is no correct solution in some sense. The people are still doing research and to get more things. These are just some of the research things that I have mentioned. And the people, when you are like, for example, in a company, you try to do that, you actually do all, try all, all of these things essentially. And then uh, based on the things that you are using, you see which one works better according to some measures, then you may choose that one. So for example, here, as I mentioned, this is the, if you want to consider the problem as a clustering, as I mentioned, some algorithm like k-means may not work because k-means generally, it just produces a, a small number of clusters, which is not the case. Here, we expect a large number of clusters. Good. So let me just uh, uh, do this one. So one thing that actually the making decisions makes it uh, much easier is crowdsourcing. This is a very important one. So sometimes to make the decision, you can do all this sort of thing, clustering algorithms and uh, this, uh, classifications. But another way that it will be used by huge companies uh, essentially uh, is um, crowdsourcing. In particular, the most famous one is the Mechanical Turk or MTurk by Amazon. There are other one, essentially rabbit task. And others, they are doing the similar thing. What is the idea? The idea is that I have actually used it and each of you can do that. So for example, if you have a G Cloud uh, account, which is, it can be your actually your Gmail account, you can go to the G Cloud console. All this uh, cloud, they have it, the console. The same thing here also, for example, if you have AWS account, you can go AWS console, that is for cloud computing. You can use the same account for mechanical tech, which is Amazon has essentially mechanical tech. And they heavily use that one for their application. What is the idea? So you want to, I mean, do this kind of classifications, you want to use the users who give you the solution for you. So, for example, you want to see whether these two, two iPhones are the same or not. You can easily go there in the mechanical Turk. You can create very simple kinds of uh, HTMLs like this, for example. You will mention these items and then say that your choice, whether they are the same or not, and then reason for that. You can easily create that one. And then you will say this one, two important things that here you need to say. Then you need to say anyone who answers that, I will give you 10 cents. So these are essentially the people that they are coming, answering your question, and then, then they can possibly get 10 cents. Okay, why I say possibly? So these people who answer your things, you have say three days, I think two or three days, they answer your thing. In two to three days, you may go and say that, oh, this guy, it was not the correct answer by some criteria. And you decide that this person should not get the money. Otherwise, after two to three days, by default, that person gets the money. No, what is the problem? The issue is that uh, you don't want that any arbitrary person is doing that because uh, you may have seen, some of you may have seen uh, YouTube. At YouTube, Sometimes they are asking some questions. Frankly speaking, I never answered them correctly. I just said some random thing to go. Why? Because YouTube does not have any rewards for me. Here you have the reward. You get the money, essentially. But you don't want, I mean, how do you know that these are not the bots that they just come click and this is, that is not a useful thing. You really want to get something useful. The best thing, each of these people, these are the mechanical therapy, these are the people who are coming and do that. 
they have some score. What is their score? Generally, higher quality means higher score. And this means higher uh, money or a uh, higher uh, cost. You can say that I want this one because I mean, that does not make sense. You may put it five cents or 10 cents. Still lots of people come and answer it. But what is the problem? The problem is that they don't answer it correctly. And then you may need to go and check it. And then if you want to go and check it, then you will really solve the problem. Why do you want to pay these people? So you really want that, make sure that these people are answering correctly. To do so, you need to go with the people who have high scores. Why? Because these scores, if a person has a higher score, I will go and say that this he gave the wrong answer, then his score or her score comes down. So the people are trying to keep their scores high, but to recruit these high score people, you need to pay more. Maybe 10 cents is not enough. One dollar you need to pay. That's the thing that, for example, that happens at Amazon. So they want to do some of these ones. They need some of these classifications. They want to say from some of, for example, a, a typical things. This review. Whether you want to say this review is from a person or from a machine, essentially. One way is to use some of these uh, mechanical terms, their own system. Uh, then you can go there and you can get it. But then you need to pay top money to pay to the high essentially people who have uh, higher scores, they can give you better answers, but of course you need to spend more. So these are some of the applications. It is a very good one. I think you can just go there and just test it. That's a very useful one. Lots of applications that you can do it. Uh, however, some applications that you should not do it. Uh, this is very useful. One of the things that is say, you have a website, a course project or other things. You can create it a startup. One way to get the money for a startup, they will always say how many users they have. Good. So uh, what can you do? You can create a task and say that this is my task. So you will go to this website. This is your website. And then you will log in. Just cre essentially create a user. And here, Essentially, in this box, this is the edit box. You can, this edit box, you will just write user ID that you created on my website. So, then say you have $1,000. You will say 10 cents, I will give it to anyone who is doing this task. It is very easy to check because this user ID that they are mentioning it they will, uh, you can check whether they have created or not. If they have not created, you don't give them even 10 cents. So with $1,000, you can actually have 10K users on the event. On the event. Good. So, uh, and, but this is not allowed at Amazon mechanical theory. Some others, they may allow some version of it, but this is generally is not allowed. It. If they know that they will ban you, they will essentially alert you. If you do it for the second time, they will ban you forever. And this is very cheap. With 1,000, you get 10K users. It's very cheap, actually. Because otherwise, you need to pay, actually, people at YouTube and others, they will come to log into your website. And that's very costly. You may need to pay $1, $2 for a user if may or may not come to your website. Here, by 10 cents, you can actually get lots of users. And this is the one that you can put it, actually, the score can be zero because you don't care who is coming to your website. You just want to say, I have 10K users. So all these guys that they have a low score, they will come to do that. And they have incentive to do that. They, they get 10 cents and also potentially if they are doing some tasks correctly, then their score goes up. But they are banning. Another thing that you can do is here say that reason for answer. Here you can say, uh, here you say that instead of reason for answer, say your name or your email. If you put this one, also they ban you. Why? They don't want that you will get this information from the user. 
Why? Because if you get it, potentially they can, these people can be your customers. You can directly contact them. They are not allowing them to do that because they don't that they want that the people come through your website is through this mechanical therapy and you hire them. The same thing, for example, if you have Airbnb, Airbnb does not like that. If you want to get some place from some uh, other person, if you go directly with that person, <laughs> then you don't need to pay Airbnb fee and then you can save actually quite a bit of money. Airbnb tries everywhere such as if you give the phone number or something, they may not allow that happen. They want that you are using your system. So the same thing here, they, they say that you cannot use their things. And one interesting thing that, for example, in the website, if you can, instead of that, you can, as I mentioned, you could ask them to go to the website and log in. Yeah. But generally nowadays the logins are with Gmail or Facebook ID or something. When you log in Google or Facebook, they are giving their email to the website that you essentially use it. So in some sense, if you say login, it is better than asking them directly to enter their name because through login, actually you get their name, their first name, their photo, and even their email. But these are banned. At least in mechanical theory, others may work. So this is another application that is, some of them, they are not checking that rigorously. That's one way essentially that you can get lots of users. And I mean, it makes sense. They should have this because one other thing that the people may use it is the hacking. You want, somebody wants to hack a system, just say that I will give you one cent if you click on this link. Again, if this link is this website is in Google Cloud, that nothing happens because Google has something for this kind of attack. But if some kind of legacy government thinks, you can actually bring down that website. But I don't know. If you just pay $1,000, one cent per each click, uh, you can get, I don't know, uh, 100,000 instant click and then you can bring the site website down. So these are banned. So you cannot do everything, but that is this mechanical third, you have access to this crowd sources to do this thing is very useful. And as I mentioned, Amazon and others, they are doing it. Uh, last but not least, that so this is like this crowdsourcing is the way to essentially use humans or this mechanical character essentially to decide whether these two make decisions whether these two records are the same or not. Sometimes the people use it. So some of them, uh, this is also a typical thing. For some of uh, for some of these records, for lots of them, you can just use ML techniques to do that. But some of them, the score is very close to match or not match. It is like 50-50. Only for those guys, you may want to use humans. And that's another applications of humans. Not for everything. Those that you know the algorithm, them can do it much cheaper than you use the algorithm decide whether it is match or not. For those which are 50-50, you don't know that this is the approach that you can get actually to humans crowdsourcing it and solve it. Then you have made the decision. Finally, you need to do canon canonicalization. So when you know that these two are the same, then you need to make sure that everything is the same. For example, if there are uh, so you want to merge information from duplicate mentions or record to construct a cluster representing this maximal information. If you know this person and this person are the same, then for example, if the, uh, these are like, this is the address and this is the address, you may consider this one does not have the phone number. You will essentially merge them with the maximum information. This is the address and this is the phone number. Uh, so, uh, There are some of these issues that, I mean, you need to be careful. Some of them, for example, a phone number of one person might be incorrect. So, I mean, these are some rules that you can do it essentially. Do that. It's, even the canonicalization is not trivial, as I mentioned. Maybe one of these users in one of these phone numbers gives the wrong phone number. That happens a lot that you will call someone, especially for a bank, and does not work, or for this business does not work. Because this was there, but now it's not active. So even that is non-trivial. There are some based uh, rule-based things, for example. For names, typically the longest names are used. For set values, you take the union. It, again, it's not necessarily correct, but this is some way because some of this phone number might be wrong. For strings, 
you can learn the edit distance. So if there are different strings is used, these are, if these are identical, you use one of them. But maybe there are different strings, essentially, I don't know. Uh, for something, there is some strings. Then this is something called centroid. So centroid is some string which is somehow close to lots of strings. There are some algorithms for that. It is a bit heavy in terms of computation, but you can compute it. So instead of all of them, in some sense, you will take the average string. This is centroid. Uh, for num sometimes you can use the majority rule to fix error. For example, if four out of five says a business is closed, then the business is closed. You want to say whether this business is closed or not. If five of them, but this is always not, this is also not all the time correct because generally the people copy from each other, the website copy from each other. If one of them is closed, lots of them is closed, and that might be all of them might be wrong. Good. So these are, again, this step itself, also lots of research that people are doing, even canonicalization. You see, it is might be easy. You found these people, these people are the same. I have decided by any way to make decision that these two are the same. Even I, to merge them, it is non-trivial. Which one should I get? It's such that I can get the data more accurately. And why it is important? Because if you get the data more accurately, then you can probably sell it much more expensively to the others. So it is very important to get the best way, and that's the thing that the people are doing research to get it. There is again, I mean, so far there is no correct or wrong solution. Everything is some spectrum. Can you get better for this data, more precise? Because if you know that, for example, if this website that, for example, at Amazon we were using to see whether two users, this Facebook ID is the same as this Google ID. If there are lots of mistakes, then you may not, Amazon may decide to use an alternative website. But if your the quality is good, then they are using it. So, uh, so even the canonicalization is a non-trivial task, and there are some researches that people are doing that. So uh, this entity resolution is a nice thing, as I mentioned, in general, this type of uh, uh, unsupervised clustering is a more researchy thing than there is uh, supervised uh, clustering, uh, supervised learning is somehow it's much easier than unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning, there are lots of research that ongoing research that is that the people are doing. And as we discussed, this kind of uh, um, clustering or entity resolutions are very famous important and important case of uh, unsupervised learning. Good. So uh, I think uh, we will come back. Uh, to talk about uh, missing data. The missing data, I will give you a general idea. We already talked about it. I will just give you one uh, past summary of the things that we discussed on some other techniques. And then we talk about uh, briefly about visualization that you are doing that how you can, that this is again, the visualization is some uh, intro to visualization. We will talk more about it in later sessions. So, So let's uh, continue. We talk about entity resolution, which is something that affects the quality of our data. Another thing that affects the quality of the data is missing data. As we talked about it before, generally we have the missing data when, a, when we have NAN. So NAN, essentially in Pandas, we have it, or other places you might have different things, but it means that null, for example, we don't have those records. And this essentially quality of our data will be down because of that. So how can we handle it? And if you are, for example, if you want to use some kind of ML algorithm on top of this, because of this, you may not get the best results that you want. So uh, this missing data can call, I mean, because of several reasons. For example, people may not answer questions on a survey. It might be inaccurate recordings of the height of the plants that needs to be discarded. Or it can be canceled runs in a driving experiment due to rain.
So this may happen essentially because of lots of reasons. And uh, I mean, something happens and we don't have the date. So, uh, the main question, key question is that, why is the data is, so why is the data missing? That we need to understand. If we, and if we can answer that, somehow we can try to mitigate the situation and find some essentially resolution for those mistakes. data can happen, I mean, sometimes it can be, you may have missing completely at random. What's the meaning of that? Is that probability of missingness independent of the sample itself? So, I mean, for example, you can think about it, you have um, saved this one on some hard drive and there is some bad sectors or others. Random, some of these data are missing. So in that case, I mean, that is a, I mean, that's in some sense is a good case if the number of parts that we are missing are not too many. Because why, because throwing out this missing data does not buy us the inference because it's all at random. At the same time, you need to be careful, as I mentioned, the reduced size might be still a problem. So this uh, MCAR, there is another case. It is missing at random. But this probability that it is missed is, uh, depend, is dependent on the available information. So uh, yes, it is, it's random. Some of them are missed, but the probability that it is missed is based on some variables that we have. So what is the example? For example, uh, consider, I mean, this field, sex, race, and education of people. Then based on that, the probability that the earning is not provided would be essentially different. It means that the probability that is different is somehow based on this particular instances. For example, I, I don't know if a, a female, this particular race and this particular education, they don't want to mention their earnings. That is dependent, this is not, yes, it is random. Some people they have mentioned it, but the probability would be higher for certain, take certain race and certain education. <laughs> what is the good things in this case? If we know that it is the case, and if we have this other information, sex, race, education, we can actually, this is the idea, can we do some modeling based on the variables that we know the values? So essentially what we do, this is the whole thing. You want to create this one. So this is based on, I don't know, this is the sex, race, and education, and this is the earning. So this earning, I mean, the whole database you may want to use for some other application, but you know that based on this, we can do that. So the idea is that if it is the case, then some of these earnings you have, some you don't have it. Some missing at random. Then you may actually run an ML algorithm to fill in this space. And then based on that, you may do some other. But of course, you need to know that it is dependent on that. So the fact that why the data is missing is helping us to somehow mitigate the situation.
So uh, there are other reasons. So these cases, in some sense, we can handle it. But there might be the case that, I mean, missingness depends on unobserved predictors. So there are, I mean, yes, it is dependent on some variables, but we don't have that variable. Then, of course, the situation might be harder. You need to, maybe the best way is to first find what are those predictors. Maybe you can ask those ones, try to get this extra columns that you are missing. And this extra column, by the way, you might be able to do it by some join some other tables. That you have. Then you have more data. Then you may you might be able to have if all the variables and you have a good dependence. And that you can actually check it. We will you can run a ML algorithm and depends on the essentially uh, accuracy of that. You mean oh this is very good. I can accurately actually find this one, so you may you might be able to fill in the data. Sometimes missing this depends on the missing value itself. Generally, people are not willing to provide their earnings if they are high. That is also a good thing, but that by itself is like, okay, the value should be highest. So, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, these are some of, if there are some unknown predictors or some other columns that you may not know, in general, if you add more variables, more columns, you can join this one with some other data, you might be able to get a, more variables that are playing the, essentially a role in this particular missing value. You may have some ML things such that you can fill in. Good. So uh, how can we essentially do, I mean, there are uh, some ways essentially to fill in the data. One easy way is to delete all uh, tuples with missing values. So for example, if you say that df drop na, that all rows with a null value or nan will be dropped. How can we remove all the columns that they have a null value? The same thing, but we will say, uh, access is equal to one. If I say access is equal to zero, it's just doing the uh, rows. If you do it this, then it removes columns. But of course, I mean, this is the simplest way to do that. Some cases it might be good, but the one issue is that if you lose that, of course you lose some data. The other thing is that, uh, I mean, you are, uh, if your the size of the data is uh, small, uh, then you may not get the actual concentration that you want. If I mean, if the data is large, generally you don't miss that much. But if the remaining data is uh, small, the variance might be too much, which does not exist in the actual data because your sample size essentially becomes a small. That's the main issue. Or you, it may bias your samples because you removed all, maybe for one city, they had some issues and they didn't record this one. All people from this city will be removed. So your data will be biased. Not the best data that you want. Uh, okay. The other approach is to fill in this essentially, which is the one that is called single imputation. So you try to fill in or impute the missing values. So these are like a simpler one versus the harder one. The advantage is, is that you have better precision since you keep all the data, you don't lose them. And you, you have less bias. The issue is that uh, the disadvantage is that if you are not careful, uh, these things that you are adding, the standard error, the deviation would be much less. So you may not have that much var uh, essentially variance that you have in your actual data. I will explain this one of the next. So one, I mean, essentially thing that we already talked about, you want to replace each missing value with the mean of all of their values. In particular, for example, you will say this one, a df z uh, 
Il NA. Il NA. What? DF. V. Mean. Also, you need to say in place equal to two. Otherwise, you need to say, because you, you want to have, you get just one column, you want to change that column. You need to say in place to such that it changes in this one. It doesn't produce a new column for you. Same place you want to do that. Then what you say that you say that fill in a, all of these NAs with the mean. This mean is the one that ignores the missing value, compute the means, and they will put that. So the main issue that I mentioned, so it distorts the standard deviation and reduces correlation uh, coefficients by decreasing correlation. What's the meaning of that? So for example, here, you have a large data and then, uh, I mean, you have it, for example, some of these like two, three, four, and then lots of missing data. If you just compute the mean, the mean of these guys would be three essentially. So everything else would be three here. What is the problem? Essentially, it is that the standard deviation it has been changed. Probably in the real world, it was not like that. There were some five, there were some seven, six, etc. But you will put all three. At the same time, also you reduce the correlation of this coefficient. Because it might be the case that this three guy here was some function of some other field here. Or these two guys was some function of some other field here. But here you just remove that correlation. You just put three all the way. So essentially, you reduce some correlation. And that was the idea that we were talking before, that correlation is the some of the, is one of the best things in machine learning. Because from the correlation, we learn a lot. <laughs> you kill the correlation, then you will just put some arbitrary numbers. <laughs> and they are not also random enough. So for example, all of them are three. So it seems some kind of artificial thing that you are putting. Another approach it is called last value carried forward. So what is the approach? So for example, here you have two, then you have missing values, missing values, then you have three, then you have four, and then so on and so forth. It's funny that, okay, to do filling, then this is two. Then what is the last value carried? So this one is missing. So just fill it with two. This one is missing. What was the last value missing was two. So you will put it two. Three, you will do it. Then four, this is the missing value. You will put it four. Good. You will fill in this one. So if you have the previous valuation, you will put it. But if there is some natural order on your uh, data, for example, according to the time you have it, and this is some field, that makes sense that during the time, if you are missed, it is missed, it is the one that is close to mine. Or I don't know, maybe for example, you may want to get income of some people, so that, okay, the people who are living in the same neighborhood, maybe they have the same income, or at least approximately. Then that might be good. But if it's are just some random order of this data, then doing this essentially it may distort your data and may cause some unintended behavior. Good? So that's something that you need to be careful, essentially. But these are the two things, like a mean or the last value for fun. Another thing that is actually good, and the, uh, the people are using it, is the uh, using information from related observation, using k-nearest neighbor. So you have this data, for example, these people, essentially. I talked about the similarity measures between two records, this record, this vector comparison vector, the comparison vector that we had. Now you can sort the, and then you know this you can essentially find around this uh, comparison vector how much each record. So this is I have record A, and I want to say the similarity between this with A1, A2 to A N. These are all other records. I can, I can sort them according to the similarities. 
by some weight, you will put it weight times the score that gives the similarity, you will sort them. Then you will consider the K nearest guy. And then you will fill in this filling information based on this nearest name. This is actually happens a lot, lots of the time. This is called sometimes the cold start problem. What is the cold start problem? So for example, this is, I mean, a new product is coming to Amazon. You don't know how many you are selling, what are the properties of that? You may find some the nearest neighbor of this, according to some criteria, some similarity. And they say, okay, maybe the number, the people who are interested in that would be the same set of people who are interested in this product. Instead of product A, which is the cold start case, the, you will consider another one, essentially B, C, and D, which are similar to this. And based on that, you will fill in the information for this. That actually works quite well. <laughs> another thing that you may do use indicator variable. Sometimes if this is a categorical uh, data, you may, instead of filling all those guys, instead of median or something, you could fill in with missing. Just put missing there. I mean, this is one way, but probably does not help that much because NAN and missing is not a big difference. The only thing that probably NAN may give some errors, but missing may not give error. But then for some of these values, you may get it essentially missing as a result if you do some ML algorithm, which is not the best. I mean, if this is a, some kind of a indicator variable, for indicator variables, uh, I mean, uh, uh, if this is for continuous variables, then uh, you may add another field essentially. Here in the same field, you just put a missing, if this is the, something like a real, uh, some fractional or something like this that is missing, you need to add another column and on that column for those guys that are missing, you will put missing. And then uh, let your algorithm do that. So essentially, the, your algorithm somehow should understand for those missing guy should not come consider that value important. That's somehow the idea. So another approach is the simplest. I mean, this is another random imputation. You run sample from observed value for that variable. That actually is not a bad option. Sometimes I mean, you don't know, for example, we were discussing in this case, that this one, that this was missing. Uh, this is uh, two, three, four. We were putting all of these guys three. Here, instead of doing that, so I have two, three, four. Maybe I have two twos and three, four. So the I will see what is the distribution of this guy. So it was one half of the time was two, one fourth was three, one fourth was four. According to this distribution, I will fill in the rest. So with probability half, I will draw as two. With probability one fourth, I draw three. And with probability one fourth, I will draw four. And then fill in this. This might be better than just putting the mean essentially. At least uh, somehow they try to keep this uh, uh, standard deviation more realistic. Uh, as I mentioned, you can always use the regression model, essentially, or any machine learning algorithms to fill in this one based on some other things. The only thing is that you need to make sure that this missing value is somehow function of the previous guy. You should have enough columns, enough predictors that you can do this one correctly. If this is just, I don't know, somehow independent of all previous one, you can build something, but it does not give you a useful thing. This fact that we discussed here, essentially, that was the thing that we discussed here, that this one is dependent on some of these things that you know that. If you know this guy, then if you use essentially regression or any ML algorithm, you can get a meaningful thing. If it is just independent on some, dependent on some predictor that you don't have the value, you don't get any interesting things. Another thing is the multiple imputation. Here, essentially, the idea that, especially for the random case, which is also interesting. So you want to do, a, a, so you, essentially, you can see, I mean, this is like some example that is using deterministic imputation versus random imputations. 
that you might get a better result actually. But uh, this is the uh, multi, uh, it is something which is called multiple imputations. What do we do that? So what do we do essentially with your data? You have some incomplete data, S1, S2, to Sn. These are some random imputations that you are doing. So this is your table that you have it. You will randomly do this distribution and then fill in this data. This first one, this is S1. From this S1, you get some analytics. You will do some analysis, you will do some average or some machine learning or anything you want to do that. You will get this A1. Then you are doing it again. Randomly, you will put it there, you will get A2. You will do it N times and then you get this A N. Now, when you have this value to report the actual one, these are the full results that you may need to now take the average of this thing. So essentially, randomly you are putting it, but when you want to say what is the total income or the average income, then take the average of these solutions that you obtain from each other. Yeah, so for example, this is a, a, a simple example. So this is some independent variable X and independent dependent variable Y. We assume Y has a linear relation with X. Good. So say this has some kind of linear relation. But these are the missing values. So we are using this random permutation and the multiple time. So we are just doing essentially uh, According with this, this some distribution, we are filling these things in two different ways. Good. I will fill in this one. Then from this one, so I so I want to see what is the relation between x and y. There are some missing value. I will just fill in this according to some distribution, and then, but I will do it twice. Then I will compute essentially the a slope for this line and a slope for this line. This is some kind of simple linear regression. And then the question is that how do we want to report essentially the thing? So this is the slope for the first guy. This is the slope for the second guy. This is the standard error essentially, and this is the standard error for this one. So uh, the question is that what should be the correct slope? The correct slope, one way is to take the average of these two slopes and say that that should be the average. And then, I mean, you can compute also the standard deviation. So there are some, take the, so it, there is some uh, formula essentially for the variance of that. You will do the variance and then you will take the square root of that to get the standard error, standard deviation error. So, uh, but, but uh, this is the case. So to get the uh, slope, you will just take the average of it. So this is essentially some kind of a statistical analysis because this is the data that you have it, you are doing some operation and you are getting some data. It is not clear whether necessarily if you take the average, it would be a good average for the actual things or not. For example, here in this case, you will see that you had 0 0.8, you had 4.9. The slope. Then you will get something in the middle. Whether yeah, this is correct or not, these are some statistical analysis and some papers on that. But it depends how complicated because this is the data. You will change the data and you will get something. Sometimes this might there might be some good way to get some uh, things, but sometimes this random thing that you are doing essentially lot uh, much less leakage to the final thing and take the average is not necessarily a good answer. So there are some, uh, I mean, essentially the idea, these are some uh, research that is going there, for example, with Schaeffer, uh, with Schaeffer 1999 or Graham, these the people discussing that how many times you should do this, essentially, if you want to do this uh, multiple imputation, how many times you should do it, according to how many missing data you have, how much data you have, because if you have a little bit missing data, lots of known data, maybe you can just do it a few times, but if you have lots of missing data, you may need to do that. So there are some computations that the people have done. You can read it. These are, again, more research things, essentially. <laughs> and I mean, there are some formulas. You can just go there and then see how many times you can do it. And again, there were some computations, some other papers. I know this one that they had it, it was not correct. You may need to do it more, essentially, <laughs> imputation to get the result, yeah?
So, so uh, which one? No, no. Uh, this is the variance of essentially this data that you have. So this this was the slope of the line, and this was the standard deviation of this data from the this line. So these are two different things essentially. So is that variance of uh, this is the. I mean, uh, uh, this is. Uh, I mean, you want to say something like this. Again, this is some formula that you do it. I mean, but this is the one something, I mean, the people, this is a natural thing. So the, for the variance of that, this is a formula that is suggested by people. And you will just use this formula and take the variance and then take the square root. That would be a, some, essentially a standard error of the data that you get it. And uh, this one, a slope is this one. These are the some formula that I've mentioned. How precise, I mean, these are some things. I mean, there are some papers on them. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it, it, again, some I am just giving some uh, more general ideas. These are the research ideas. So it's not the case that this is the final thing. The people are doing research. The people giving papers. Say, how many samples you need to do it? As I mentioned, for example, there was this paper, and then there is this this paper that no, this the number of samples that this guy mentioned it was not correct. You need to do it more samples to get the same uh, essentially precision that you wanted. Maybe more random in the samples you need. Because each instance you are doing, there is some, con you need to do this one, fill in, and then do compute all of these heavy uh, operations on this database. So you generally don't want to take too many samples to get a good result. But this one, for example, said no. The, the previous one was, I mean, some estimates said that no. If you want to get such a precision, you may need to do it many more of this. And of course, many more of this, it might be just too expensive in terms of computation. Another thing is, uh, this is essentially Bayesian imputations. Uh, what is the idea? Is the idea essentially that we talk about it? So Bayesian inference. It, there is two things essentially. One is the frequent, frequentist method. Frequentist methods, these are in general. So, okay, I want to get it based on how many times this happens. What is the if I get enough con uh, concentration, I have a good result. So based on the numbers, they are. These Bayesian ones are more based on inference. If you remember the example that we had it, this uh, early on in this uh, class about the probability, we had two uh, essentially bags that they had some kind of uh, uh, like black and uh, black balls, which was useless or worth nothing and there was one this was a gem and it was very valuable and there we use essentially inference to see that if you bring one ball out and it is black either you need to change these two bags or not if you remember the earlier we mentioned <clears throat> generally the idea is that uh, uh, so uh, if you want to uh, so if you want to essentially, you have some data, you have some, uh, so uh, in, the, in general, in the, uh, in the Bayesian setting. So, uh, I mean, this is the same setting that we uh, discussed before. If you have some of this data from the distribution that you have it, you might be able to essentially, uh, some of the information that you have it, you may essentially use it to get some of those variables or distribution that you don't know uh, much more precise than uh, frequentist method. So in, in some sense, it is the case that in the frequentist, if you want to get this one using the frequentist method, you need to do it uh, many more in, 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 like random imputation to get the same precision that if you are using some of the data that you have it and try to get this data. Anyhow, this is, uh, again, I don't want to go to the details. You can read more about this kind of Bayesian imputation and the thing that is sometimes, but the Bayesian imputation generally is much harder to do than frequentist. Frequentist is much easier. You just repeat the things and just take the average or something. Bayesian generally is much more complex. And not all the time you can do it or you have the math to do that. There are other advanced methods like the matrix compilation approaches, regression-based uh, things that we talk about it. This matrix compilation, there's a lot of things essentially on that. 
And I mean, there are multiple imputation chain equations. These are like some of the papers that you can actually see and just search on it and then both imputations and how many times you should do it, Bayesian versus frequency, so, so that you can get a lot of information. Good. So uh, last but not least, I wanted to just go briefly about the matplotlib. I think I will mention this one because I expect that you will go and work with this one. This is one of the most, uh, I mean, complicated one in uh, Python, but it is very useful. It's very powerful. We can essentially draw everything. We will talk about the different drawings and the essentially ideas behind them in a later session. But here I just want to give something that you will start and work with. And what are the functions? So these are the things that is, these are some kind of cheat sheets that you can always use it, but these are the different these are the different versions of Matplot. And some of them it may work in some version, not the other one. I think the best thing is that you will try them, try to get essentially be professional in using them. They are very useful. These are like some of the best one essentially to draw figures. So uh, these are some of the things that I want to just mention. So to initialize, say we are initializing NumPy as NP and the matplot pi plot as PLT. That's a typical name for it. Now, if you want to, I mean, just say prepare some, I want to draw some simple diagram. I will just ge generate X to be a lean space, this one. This, if you remember, we said that we are generating 1,000 samples equally a space between zero to four times. Then I will compute the sign of this one. Uh, and this is essentially x is a vector, this would be the uh, sign of this. Then you are doing the rendering here. So you want to draw it. So you will put essentially, this is important. So you will plot subplots, you will get it two things, the fig and x, or x actually. Then in the x, you are adding the plot, ask the fig to show it. And that's the thing that you will get it, you will observe this one. So it's a few lines, you can draw very nice diagram. If you want to save this one, this is actually useful. You can use it save fig. This DPI essentially said that, uh, how, what is the quality of this? You can actually just draw this one as a PDF or anything that you want. And then you can just, you can, it is very easy to send an email using Python. You can just do that one, compute something and email yourself. So it is very easy way to compute something and then nice diagram and then send it. I have done this and actually they are both great. So uh, these are, uh, so this uh, matplotlib offers several kinds of plots here. So uh, one of them, for example, if you want to just, uh, this uh, scatter is something that you are uh, generating some X and Y and you will uh, scatter. So essentially just draw this one, 100 numbers you are between zero and one you are doing for X and one and you will uh, scatter and you will draw this. Another one is the bar one. So the bar one is that, I mean, you are, <laughs> this is the NPA range 10. It means that essentially number from <clears throat> zero to nine. And then for each of them, you will put a height, which is some random number between one to 10. <clears throat> and then uh, essentially you are just drawing this one, the bar diagram. So this is a scatter, this is bar diagram. This other one is the one that uh, you are, just, this is the, another interesting thing. So you are generating in a two dimensional number, uh, two dimensional array, and this is, some uniform distribution between zero and one, and it is eight by eight array. Then this eight by eight array, you can actually show it here. This is some kind of heat diagram. We will talk more about that. This heat diagram, there is another one called contour. That's another heat diagram that it shows that. We will talk uh, about the, what are the applications of it. Another one is the pie chart. So you are essentially, uh, this NP random, some uniform number between zero, one, and four, between zero, 0 and 1, you are generating four numbers that uh, essentially random. And then according to how many you have it, then you have a pie chart. Or this is the other one is the histogram. Histogram is also very important. So you will you are designing essentially um, generating a random numbers from normal distribution, 100 of them between 0 and 1. And then you will do the histogram that actually has a normal distribution that shows that. You may have this kind of error bar. So you will say this is the range, this is essentially the, uh, the number random, this is X and Y, and then you define error bar to be 
essentially this the height of this between y like y over four. <laughs> you can actually read the exact details of them in the matplotlib, or you can get it from ChatGPT. Uh, the same thing, you can have a nicer, essentially, error bar, like box plot using this. You can have a tweak. This tweak, actually, you can uh, uh, you can have, uh, say that I want to design this plot as just with kind of uh, just solid lines, or with the dash lines, or you want to change the width of it, or you may want to have some mark. Another thing that is very useful, if you want to have two diagrams and the same things. So you will say that this is x, this is x is the same, but they have a different y, but you want to draw both of them at the same things. Then you will say a x plot, x y one, x y two. That's actually done in one, it draws both of them together. Sometimes you want to do it in a separate things, but you can actually, this plot is the important one. Plot is an array, you can think about it. Here we are doing two subplots, one is uh, here we have two rows and one column. Then you will say that draw the first one on the first one and the second one on the second. This is an array essentially. You will consider the whole thing, make it as an array. That's a very useful way of seeing the whole screen as an array. And we can do different things there. It can be this kind of here we just the same thing. We we are saying that we want to have one row and two columns. It's just doing that. You can put a label. So if you want to put a label on top of that, you will set a title for the whole things. Or if you want to set a label for a, a essentially X label or Y label here, for Y label, we say no, none, nothing is here. But for X label, I will put it time. As I mentioned, save is a very important one. This is for the beginners. Now, if you want to do it more for uh, intermediate users, this is this is especially a bit also a bit more complicated to work with it. So if you have such a diagram, these are essentially called ticks. So these ones are called ticks. Now you have some minor. So you have a major ticks and minor ticks. So the ma the major ones are these big ones. These are major ones. And minor ones are these in between guys. Now for each of them, you can say, how do you want to do it? This is a diagram. So for example, here you will define what should be the format of the major ticks and uh, essentially the format of the minor tick. And here it is interesting. So you will say that the, for the tick parameters, you say that I want to put the uh, axis essentially for the minor and I want to rotate it. As you will see here, this is zero, one, two, three, but these guys had the rotations. The minor ones had the rotation, but not the major ones. Uh, you can have uh, essentially, you can hear also the color. For example, you can say which color should be that, what should be the, uh, like how do you, uh, what type of marker you should use it. I mean, some of this, you can, I, I don't remember all of them. You can also check it there. But uh, these are different, for example, for the different colors, you have a different color and you can say which color I want to use it, what should be the shape. Uh, you can have it essentially different scale. So instead of, for example, instead of just doing X and Y in the same scale, you can have a log scale. You just put it, the set X scale to be log. Or you may have, I mean, put some kind of, text and you may want to, for example, this part, you may want to shade it. You can just do that. Or you want to put a, a legend. Legend essentially is some of these uh, like labels that you are putting it on different places. You can say exactly where do you want to put it with which color, in which location you can put it there to put it nicely. Or you want to do a annotation, etc. And again, the size of it, if you want to save the size and the precision, you can also decide this one, what should be the size, this would be the size, and then you can figure, essentially save it with which precision. Uh, yeah, there are uh, many more things essentially about if you want to make it transparent, if you want to, I don't know, uh, offline rendering, uh, so different colors, different takes, you can have multi lines. This, so these are all of this. I mean, if you want to, this type of nice things, you can do a lot essentially with this. If you do it more advanced type of things with matplotlib, and this is actually a, this two three things is very good. Uh, 
cheat sheet such as you see these are the things that you can do it and then you can check what is the format you ask chat gpt and give you but just be careful this version that you may get it may not work with the current version you need to always try once and save it for yourself such as later you can use it. Uh, but anyhow this is this is the final thing this is just the last thing that it has everything in just one page this is a cheat sheet if you've had one cheat sheet if you go for some interview, you want to make sure that you know the basic one, you can have this one. And then it says about everything, pie chart, text charts, all of these, these are the things. But again, all of them, you need to uh, essentially do it once or twice before and save it for yourself. The best way is that you just know about them, you have tried them before, and then whenever you need it, you use one of them. We will say that when you need what, and what are the, these are like visualization is something that has been there forever, essentially. So the people thought about it, where should I use pie charts? Where should I use histogram? Where should I use this one? We will talk about some of the applications there. Now you know how you can use it, depending your application to visualize. We say, oh, I, this is, for this situation, pie chart is a good one. I will go and this is the instruction I have used it before I just draw it. Very fast and you have a very nice. And that's it. that's actually very important because visualization is very important. All things that you are doing at the end of the day, you want to show it to someone else, to your manager, to high, uh, higher ups, etc., or for yourself essentially, or your colleague, etc. So it is very important to know about them and use them. And yeah, so I think uh, I stop uh, here. Yeah, these are like all the colors, etc. You can have everything that you want. So all of them are available in the slides, you can just uh, use them.